Hiya guys, welcome along, Nigel here with you, Nigel's Modeling Bench and this is the one you've all been waiting for, this is going to be part one of the HK Models 148 Scare Avril Lancaster B Mark I build Now, all of my builds kind of are kind of beginner focused, okay? Not so much be beginner focused, but sort of newer modelers focused and that's what uh, people tend to like So. Throughout this build, I'll be, you know, maybe to the more experienced modelers, there'll be some quite obvious tips, you know, things we just do naturally anyway. But, you know, to the newer modelers out there, they really like to get the little hints and tips that help them along. It gets the better models, it sometimes saves them a bit of money, you know, and it's just, it's just fun all round to show you, to show you what I do, you know, really, and, and pass on the knowledge. So um, that's what this is going to be. It's not going to be like a beginner build. I'm not going to start talking about tools and, and, you know, different types of thinners and what sort of paints you can use and all that. I'm not going right back to basics, but it will be sort of, you know, for, for instance, I'm going to be using the interior set on this. I've got the, um, the masking set for it because I hate masking canopies. And also I've got the intake set for it as well because I wanted the um, these little um, grills that go over the little small intakes in the sides of the engines. I wanted them in photo etch rather than in, in plastic. So in fact, I'm not even sure in this kit if they are plastic. I know in the 30 second scale they are. Um, I'm not sure in this one if they give you plastic grills, which seems pointless because you can't see through them. Now they've got the grills attached, so they've got this, this lump of plastic on here. You can see there, we've got a glossy paper which is a pain in the ass. You can see there on part I-16, it's got that lump of plastic attached to the front, whereas it should be a very, almost like a tea, a tea strainer grill. So what we're going to do is um, basically start off by going into the manual. Now we go straight into the manual, it goes straight into the build of the cockpit. And here we've got, the. this is the instructions you can go onto Edward's site Edward whatever you want to call them and you can print off their instructions in A4 color rather than using the small ones that come in the kit and I find it's a lot better to have these especially when you've got more complex things like this is all fairly simple but sometimes you get sort of complex little assemblies and it's uh, you know it's it's a really good guide to show you where you, where to cut and where not to cut and stuff so the first thing I'm going to do um I know you've probably got some glare on here but the first thing I'm going to do and I generally do this if I'm using an aftermarket photo etch set because the although these these photo etch sets are made for this particular kit I mean you could get the Tamiya one but it won't fit certain things certain panels are a lot smaller and bigger and whatever I don't know which is right which is wrong we're not looking at accuracy in this we're looking at well we are because I've made resin engines as you all know um, to make it look more accurate because the standard engines I think look horrible um, but basically you know there's a lot of stuff missing in the cockpit and it's it's not the best uh, when you compare it to some other 48 scale kits. The 30 second scale is is disgusting for what it is and for what it costs. But um, as you know, I've just re re, uh, reviewed Robert's beautiful 3D printed resin cockpit. If you haven't seen that, go back and have a look. That's the 30 second scale for the Hong Kong models kit. So what I do, um, I will generally go through the instructions and make a mark. I can You can get a pencil. Okay, so you can rub it off afterwards if you keep your instructions or you can use a red pen. I was just about to use a red pen, but one of the biggest problems using a red pen is generally if you make a dot on one side of the paper, it comes through the other side. So that's, that could be a pain in the ass. And all I do is I go along, you can see here, we've got I-13, that's the rudder pedal assembly. So I put PE there. Okay, so I don't forget, so I don't go on and build it and then realise I should have... Um, I should have not, you know, not put anything on there. So down here we've got this um, this, this oxygen basket that's going to go on the back of the seat. So I'll put PE there. Okay, and then we've got um, J53. That's a panel going into the side of the fuselage by the look of things. So that's going to be over the page, I would think. Yep, J53, that's got PE. And then we've got J37, that's the engineer's board, which is going to be on the side of the cockpit so you get the idea I'm just going to go through here okay and mark everywhere that I'm going to everywhere that I need to put PE you don't need to watch me do that on camera so I'll turn the camera off and I'll come back in a sec right so I've marked up all the instructions now we've got we've also got some parts being completely replaced with PE some radio boxes and stuff so that should look pretty nice so um, we'll crack on with the build so I'm going to go follow the instructions from step one I normally deviate and I probably will on this build but um 
We'll, uh, we'll start off with the seat, which is what the instructions, su instructions suggest. So we've got the two seat halves going together, then the seat back going in, and then we've got the cushion and the armoured plate, the backs, the armoured plates on the back. Uh, and then we've got the, uh, the cushions going in. So I'm going to assemble the seat, just the sides of the back, but not put the cushions in yet. And then I can spray the seat as one, and then I can paint the, the cushions um, individually and put them in afterwards. It'll save me having to do any masking or anything. So if you remember, we said I did a review of these. Um, thank you, Keith. Mr. Waterhouse bought me these and, and sent them through. So very generous of him. And uh, these are the um, Trumpeter single-sided nippers. So we're going to see how we get on with them. They cut very, very nice, but I am yet to be convinced they're going to last Um because all the trumpeter tools I've bought don't tend to last very long. So um, start off here. So we're going to take off the, the actual seat sides themselves off the sprue. Now I can see here I've got a very, very flimsy. There's, a, there's an arm there which is the support for the, um, for, this, for the armor plating. So we always cut that first. Okay, so it's always best to cut anything that's a bit fragile. It looks like it might be broken off already actually. But we'll, no, it's not. Anything that's a bit fragile, always cut that first. Otherwise... When you come to um, cut the rest off, it's hang on and it will probably snap off. And this is where having a good set of nippers is really good as well, because if you've got an old pair of clippers and like, or some wire cutters or something, as you cut, they kind of push the plastic apart and they like to break that off, whereas this won't, okay? Because it's, uh, because it's so sharp and brand new and everything. So apparently these things you can use and you get absolute minimal cleanup. So we shall see. We shall see how we get on. That felt quite thick there. So we'll cut those off and then we've got the back here with the armour plating on. So we'll cut that off as well. Okay and then once we've got that off we can come in with our nippers then and remove any excess sprue that's already there. And then I can come in and clean it with a knife and then come in with my photo etch Infini sanding sticks. It's nice to see that Hong Kong models are finally thinking about things. They've got the sprue connection points in areas you don't see. You know, I, th I think in previous models they would have put one right there, right on the top, where you, the only place you're really going to be seen on it. So um, I'm clean up these little pins here. So I'm going to be very careful not to snap these off. What I'm doing here, guys, is cutting into my finger, which is what most modelers do. You must, if you're new to the hobby, if you're a little youngster or whatever, be very careful. Don't go doing this because you'll cut yourself. But it's something you'll learn to do. I can actually push my thumb into that blade without cutting myself. Either because my skin's got thicker or it's just old age and experience, I think. That's all it comes down to. So trim that off of there. Just like so. Trim some off of there. There we go, look at that, that Infini PE stick is perfect for getting in there. In between those pins, turn that off of there. Okay, and don't worry guys, I'm not going to be, this is just because we're just starting. Um, as I move forward through the kit, I'm not going to be forcing you to watch every single part be removed and cleaned up. This is just, this is just an initial sort of, this is what I use sort of thing. For the uh, for the newer modelers out, this is what I use, and this is how I do it. Um, as I say, I'm not going to go at length into tools and stuff. If, if you look at my Vulcan build, I did a, the final video I did on my Vulcan. I went through all the tools I used on that, and all the paints and everything, and it's all very much similar. I mean, modeling is actually very repetitive. You use the same sort of processes, the same tools you know, all the way along. I've actually cut the corner of the seat off there. That's why that was so difficult to cut. What an idiot. So um, be careful of that. Just have a look at the sprue where I cut it off. You can see I've left a corner of the seat on there. <laughs> what an idiot. So anyway, that doesn't matter because luckily it's into the left hand side. It's not going to be seen at all. So um, I'm not going to worry about repairing it or filling it or anything. So here we go, that's mistake number one. I do make a lot of mistakes, guys. Okay, so they can go together now. now that's quite a tight fit. It's almost like a snap-together fit. Um, 
And having watched another build online, it would appear that pretty much everything in this kit is a very tight fit. It's like they haven't taken the um, the fit tolerances into into um, they haven't kept the fit tolerances in mind when they've designed the tooling. So I've I've met a few. I mean, I'm an engineer myself, if you don't know, but I've met a few young engineers myself that don't. They don't. They they think a one inch bar will go in a one inch hole. Well, it, it won't. Um, that's why you have interference fits and clearance fits and H3 and H7 and all that, all those different fits. And um, it looks like what they've done here has got like one millimetre pins going into one millimetre holes. Well, that's foolish. It doesn't work. But because it's plastic, we get away with it. If it was steel, it wouldn't go. So this is going to go in that way, obviously. So it's not that bad, the detail on the seat. It's there. Um, we can see there that those arms want to splay out. So what I'm going to do is, before I fit this in, I'm just going to give those arms a little tweak. In fact, I need to, I've need to. i left a bit of a sprue nib on that one. I need to get new glasses, guys. I'm normally, I would normally do this under a magnifier, but so that you can see what I'm doing. I'm not doing it under a magnifier. But yeah, I need to get new glasses. Because I can hardly bloody see what I'm doing here. Okay, so that's going to go in there, and then we'll just get a very small drop of extra thin, run that down there, another little drop down there. Okay, hold those together. Okay, so that's our backrest in. Just put a bit more glue down there, a bit more down that seam, get it all together and squeeze it. Don't want any gaps or anything anywhere. And then for these little headrests, these little supports for the... Um, for the armour plate, I'm going to use the extra thin quick setting, which is the, the lighter green lid. And just hold that together, run that into that joint, hold it for a few seconds, and it should be enough to keep it there. And that one's already there, so I can just put a drop on that one. So we're just going to hold on to them and let them go off. Okay, so that's the seat glued together. I've put some Mr. Surfacer along the front to fill in that seam because the seam can be seen from the top because the, the cushion sits in there. The other thing I want to do, we've got the rear cushion and the base cushion off. So the rear cushion is already ribbed, so that's going to look fine. But the base is just dead flat, so I'm going to actually give it a bit of a texture. This is just a, a block of wood I use with some blue tack on it. So I'm going to put the cushion into some blue tack just to hold it. And then what I'm going to do is just put some scratches in it. Okay, just some fairly deep gouges. Just like this. Okay, and then another one next to that one, another one next to that one. Just like just to like this. And then take some Tamiya Extra Thin. I'm not using the quick settings, I want it to stay wet. I'm using the ordinary Tamiya Extra Thin and brushing this on there. Okay, and let the plastic get really dissolved. It's going to take a little while because this HK plastic is quite hard. Okay, so we could just brush that on there, like so. And I could go to the centre like that. And what we end up with, I don't know if you can be able to see this on the camera, but what we end up with is a Yeah, it's very difficult to show you the light because it's so shiny. But we end up with a textured seat base. Just see if I can dim the light here. We've got like a textured seat base there, you can see it. It's, uh, okay, so it looks a bit sort of used. And then under a, you know, under, when we've got some green paint on, they look great. So there we go. So that's given that a bit of a, a bit of roughness. And then we put some paint on there, and if you don't like it, you could just put thicker paint on there, and it will it will really sort of thicken itself up. And when they're suggesting in the instructions for the seats is, um, or for the the padding, should I say, is uh, dark green leather, and they're suggesting Tamiya X5. Now X5 is a gloss colour, and that's pretty close. I think I might darken it up a bit, or I might do is just do this and then give it a, a black wash. 
or a dirty wash but we'll get those painted soon in fact we can get those painted now and um, what we're going to do pull this one out because I want the paint to go down the sides a bit more so we're going to get a bit of blue tack make it into a ball okay and then in fact we'll get a smaller ball than that make it into a ball And then I can sit the seat up on the ball, just like so. Get that to stick, push that down on there, and that'll hold it in place. And then I can get another smaller ball, because we like small balls, don't we? And then I can hold that there. There we go, so they're held in place now, as you can see, just on the ball, so now I can get to the sides. So we'll give this green a good shake. I don't remember the last time I used gloss green on anything, you can see the dust on the lid. So we'll give it a good stir as well. Blimey, it's, um, it's, there's no sediment in the bottom of the toilet. I don't remember the last time I used this. It's got to be years, it's not months, certainly. Okay, and then so what we've got that there. Now what I've got here is leveling thinner for brush painting. Now Tamiya paints are not good for brush painting. Okay, now this here is Modeler's World leveling thinner for brush painting. It's available from Premium Hobbies, and it's it's basically it's like a retarder, I think, and it does sort of the same job. So we'll get an upturned Tamiya jar, and we'll put some of the green gloss paint in there. Okay, that should be. Just there should be plenty there. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is just put one drop in there. There we go, just one drop. And what this does, it thins the paint a bit, but it makes it brush better. And if, you're, if you've been modelling for a while, you know that oh, I've got green paint on my fingers. Um, Tamiya paints are not good for brushing at all. They, they tend to sort of not want to brush, they just go down. I've always um, I've always described painting Tamiya paints by brushes like dragging a slug across a wet piece of lino. So you can brush this on quite thick, just like so. Okay, we'll get around the sides as well. And you can see that this is enabling me to brush it properly. Okay, now we'll leave that for a couple of minutes and then I'll give it another coat. Okay, and it's as simple as that. And what it does, as it says on the bottle, it will level that out. Okay, and it will look lovely once it's all dried and pulled down. All right. You can see it's starting to dry already. I'm just taking off, I did put a little bit too much on there, so I've just taken off the excess. So I'll leave that to dry for a few minutes, do it again, and then I'll come back. That's done now, and that's dried. One nice thing about that stuff, this, um, this thinner for brush painting, it kind of makes the paint go sort of semi-gloss. So it's, it's lost all its high gloss, and it's got this sort of sheen to it. Now you can see it on there now, you can see the roughed up lower cushion to make it look a bit stretched and stuff. Um, I've also done the armrests on the seat, I thought I may as well. And... Uh, See if I can mask them up when I spray the seat. If not, I'll have to just paint it again. But while the green paint's there, I'll do that. But we've got we've got other seats to paint anyway. So now the next thing to do is paint the um, the arbor plating on the seat. So first of all, same as you always do with yellow, give it a coat of flat white first, or already white, and then the yellow that I'm going to use on the top. So I'll spray it with white, then I'll spray it with yellow, and then we we'll use the masking circles to mask up and get the uh, we'll paint the seat, and then that will remain yellow, that circle in there. Um, another little tip, if ever you're spraying a large area of red, paint yellow first when you put the red down. Wow! So put white down, yellow down, and then red, and it really does make it very, very bright red. So uh, I'm going to do this now, and then I'll be back when I've done that. And there we go, cockpit is glued together and done. No, it's not, I'm just joking. It's all just placed in there. So the last thing I did was spray the headrest, or the, uh, the armour plate yellow. Um, looked up online to find out the size of the circle. It looks like it's about sort of half the width, so I'm going to go for about three and a half mil. So I'll use some masking circles for that when we come to paint the seat. Um, 
There's also some debate whether it should be on both sides or just one side, whether it should be on the front or the back. I'm going to go for both sides because it looks pretty. Um, there seems to be no real solid evidence to say either. So, i uh, got some bits off the sprue now cleaned up um, and started to sort of look at getting it all together. Now, what I am going to do is um, do some paint chipping on here. So I'll show you that with some hairspray. I'm also going to do the cockpit area there as well. And then other bits of the cockpit, we can do some chipping with other methods. So what I'm going to do, um, is looking at the Edward instructions, we've got some map pockets that go on the side here. Now obviously I don't want to be gluing them on. Let me just show you in the... Oh, i not prepared again. Um, we've got these pockets here, these... These, these are here, but they're, they're going on. So what we're going to do is actually um, get those glued on first. And then when we paint it and everything, it'll all be painted as one rather than trying to paint it and then glue them on after. They're completely missing. They should be on the, on the sides there. So um, Edward gives us them as flat metal or flat brass sheets, obviously. So I've cut three off and cleaned them off, but I thought I'd just do one for you on camera so you can see how I go about it. Um, so let's zoom you in. Okay, so you can see what I'm doing. Now for cutting um, photo etch, I always use a round blade. You can use a sharp blade like this, but the trouble is you're always going to be cutting with the tip and you're just going to be wearing the tip out. Whereas with a round blade, you can kind of come up to the surface, which I'll show you on here. If you come up to the surface, you can cut and then roll the blade around. Okay, which makes life a lot easier. So what I'm going to do is I've got this one here. I've also numbered them. I've, I've written a number on the inside of them. 61, 62, 63 and 64. So I've got one, two, three, four. Um, so all we do is we come up to the side of the brass, push the blade over at an angle. So you actually feel the side of the brass and then just roll the blade. OK, push the blade over, roll the blade. And sometimes you'll hear it go through. Sometimes you won't. There we go. Whoops, that one didn't quite come out. So we just go again. There we go. That one's come out. So this is just a piece of black acrylic sheeting, which I've got here. Um, it makes life a lot easier for cutting brass. You should never cut your brass on a soft mat or something, because what happens as you cut through, you'll bend it down. So we're just going to grab hold of this. Just take a our little PE sanding stick. You can use a file. You can use a sanding stick. You can use pretty much anything. And we're just going to basically clean off those nibs like so. Now I need to look in my magnifier to make sure they're gone. So I'm just going to have a quick look over here. And yes, they are gone. Okay, so there we go. So now we're ready to fold them. Now, you can use little plier type PE benders and stuff. I prefer to use this type of folder here. This one is a... Um, Oh, what's the name of the company now? I can't name the, the company. Uh, but you get them from little cars and stuff, and they're hold and fold, that's it. You can get cheaper ones. <sighs> Beware of the plastic ones. I don't believe they'll they'll, they'll stay clamping for very long. Um, so, and I use these type of blades here, the single-sided. There's less chance of cutting yourself. So, basically, what I do is come along with this tool, and I'll take this one here first as an example. And what I'm going to do is... Put the blade into the groove, okay? So there's a there's a groove on there for folding. And if you are new to Photo Etch, basically, if you're folding something 90 degrees, it's okay to have the etched line, the fold line, up facing you. But if it's got to go right over, always fold it away. Otherwise, when you try and fold it over 180, it'll snap, okay? So what you need to do is, if it's folded right over, back on itself, always fold it away from you if the line's towards you. If it's just 90 degrees, you can go this way. Okay, and so I'm going to put the blade in the groove and then push the... Oops, it's come out. Push the actual part underneath like that. Okay, so that's held in there now, and I know that groove is lined up, so I can just double-check, put the blade in the groove, hold it in 90 degrees, clamp that down, job done, and then I can get the blade underneath, slide it along, just to lift it and then fold it up 90 degrees, just like so. Okay, and then I can pull it out. Again, put the blade in the groove. I'm just going to grab it and make sure it is actually in the groove. There we go, it's in the groove now. Push it up. Okay, make sure it's nice and square. Come on, the blade, just roll it. I sort of just 
just do that just to lift it up so you can get the blade under and then fold it up just like that okay go 90 degrees there we go so we can just check it if it's not if we're not happy with 90 degrees or whatever we can always uh, move along um, now we look here you can see this one here is too wide okay we need to fold this box up here now you can see this one is too wide this one here is way too narrow so what I'm going to do is rather than hold the little part in there I'm going to hold the big part in there get my blade let's just nip it so I can slide it into the groove like that slide it over and I can make sure it's square because the blade is in the groove and it's butted up against these here and then I can just come along there and just lift it up just like so and that's it it's at the bottom anyway so it's not going to be seen but um there we go there we have our folded up box that's what you're going to see is the outside like that okay so the next thing to consider now is how we're going to glue them on so i'm going to get the rest of them folded up and then we'll look at how we're going to glue them on okay if you notice i've changed the camera settings slightly the reason was um because when i was putting the paper up here to show you what's going on you couldn't see anything because it's just whiting out so i've reduced the iso a little bit and i've opened up the aperture of it so let's see how things go right um so basically when we look at these parts as you can see they're folded up brass and they get glued onto the side of this pedestal here so because it's folded up brass it's only about normally six or eight thou thick um 0 0.15 0 0.2 millimeters when you glue it on you've only got that actual edge you see that edge on there you've only got that little thin edge to glue on so basically you touch it it's going to come off so what i do is i get some scraps of plastic card now with the case of these we've got number three here which is thinner so that's 0.75 plastic card and then these here one uh one two and four they are actually one millimeter deep so what i've got is some pieces of plastic card cut them to size and then what i'm going to do is glue them in so first thing to do take a knife okay hold it hold your your brass down and just basically scratch the inside just to give the glue something to bite on and then we can put the piece of plastic card so it doesn't need to be perfectly square and flat and all that it just needs to be basically um the right size to fit in there without bending it open there we go so that fits in there nice and snug like that okay so i'm going to hold that with a pair of tweezers grab a drop of super glue this is thin super glue and just let that capillary in and just go all over it put plenty in there let that go in put some in the bottom as well okay and then what we've got is a basically a block of plastic which is glued to the brass so you've got all the surface area there i've glued the tweezers on we've got all the surface area there of the plastic glued to the brass and then we can use poly cement to stick the plastic onto the side of the console there which gives us a much stronger joint so you know it doesn't need to be mega strong we're not going to be playing with it and knocking it about but when we come to weather it we don't really want to be um you know sort of knocking them off easily now i know i'm covering up the numbers but of course i've got the beauty here of having this video to look back at so i can see which one is which but i can pretty much remember that one was the biggest one two was the shortest uh, the next one down um and three was the thin one so that leaves four so we'll take this piece of plastic here drop that in there like so and that's the wrong way round remember they need to be lower than the top surface because you don't want to when you look down in the pocket you don't want to see i think i've made that one a little bit too wide it doesn't quite want to go in oh there we go it's gone in that way okay so we can hold that one in there again take what well, we didn't rough it up did i must remember to rough things up otherwise it's always worth doing with the brass whether you're in brass to brass brass to plastic whatever if you can just score it up don't sand it score it up give it a really sort of rough surface with a knife and this time i think i'm going to put a drop of glue in there i might regret this because if i drop that in the wrong place it's going to be straight away it's going to be rock solid so i'm going to drop that in there like that and that's glued in now and then we can come along just to make sure we get a nice strong joint 
let me come along and put some glue in there and this isn't just for this model this applies to any model you're doing if you've got the option to um, the opportunity to do this it's always worth doing because when you've got these little thin these little thin areas again sometimes like well, this one you, you're folding up a box and when you make that box if you can't solder it you've basically got edges like this to help with super glue and if you literally touch it you know a bit too heavy you'll find that when you paint it some lacquer thinners will actually dissolve the super glue um you know you need to be confident that it's going to stay together so what i would do if i was making up a box and i couldn't solder it i'd probably put some plastic card in the corners just as little gussets to help it all stick together it's all about surface area so finally put that one in there okay that fits in there lovely so we'll take it out okay put some super glue inside there just like so a couple of drops just like that and then pop that down in there whoops Drop that down in there in the right place. There we go. That's gone in. Okay, and now we can come along, hold this with the tweezers, and put some super glue. Into that joint. Just like so. Okay, so there we go. So that's our map pockets all done. Okay, so what I can do now is go back and look through the video and see which is which, because I can't remember already. <laughs> I know that one's number three because it's thinner. I know that one's number one because it's the taller, but I can't remember which one of those is three and four. Anyway, um, it'll probably be quite obvious when I look at the instructions, actually. Um, yeah, three is the really short one, and four is the slightly taller one. So it's one. Actually, I know three is the short one because it's thinner. So one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. There we go. One, two, three, four. There we go. So that's that's that sorted. Right. So what I'll do now is come along and get a sanding stick. Okay, quite a hard one. And just with my piece of brass. In fact, that's not the one I wanted. It's where's the thin one? And just sand the back just to make sure the plastic isn't protruding above the brass because obviously when we stick it down we want the brass to be butted up against the surface okay just like that so we can see now that that's all good all right and if you want to be a bit more confident you can come along with a magic marker or a pencil or something and just go like this and you want to see, when you sand it, you want to see that you've sanded the plastic and the brass around it is shiny. And there we go, I can see that the brass around it is shiny and the plastic is all sanded flat. So again, we come along and do this one. This is the thin one, this is number three. Okay, so we put the black pen around the around the uh, brass as well just get that on there like I can see this is going to take quite a bit of sanding because it looks like it's probably quite thick <laughs> just looking at that so I'll get the rest of these done and then when I come back, we'll get them stuck to the model. Right, so if we look at our instructions now, we can see these go on. We've got one at the back, which sits on that corner there. And then next to that one, we've got number three. And then next to that one, we've got number two. And then four is going on top of that one. So I've gone over and I've sanded them. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but I've gone over them with a 400 grit sanding stick. Um, basically so that, maybe if I can hold that, maybe you'll see them on there better. Basically, go over them with a 400 grit sanding stick. No. Um, just to give the, the paint something to key onto. Otherwise, as soon as you touch them, the paint's likely to flake off. The, most of the paints we use don't stick very well to brass. Although, I have found that Mr. Surfacer does. Um, and also, the Tamiya lacquer paints seem to as well. So, uh, we've got number one here. 
And as per the instructions, number one is going to go on this rear corner here. So we're just going to put it over there and just check that it's going to come in square because we want it to be square to the surface. OK, so I've got a little set square here I can use, I think. I'll have to use the back side of it because it's just a block. But, um, I won't go in there, I have to use this part of it. So you could use a rule. In fact, I'm not sure the end of that is square, but I do know that the end of my rule is square. So I'm going to use a rule and just nudge that up and make sure that I know that's square. OK, so now I can hold that in place. Take some Tamiya Extra Thin. I'll run that in behind there. OK, and now we have got our brass part stuck on with liquid cement. And we just give that a nudge to square it up. There we are. So that's that on there. OK, and then the next one is number three, which was the thinner one. So that one's going to go in next to it. So again, we just drop that one in there. Nudge it into position. OK, and it goes to the floor. They all go to the floor. I'm not sure these are actually accurate um I, i've got a feeling that at least one of them is actually up off of the floor so but hey ho it's 48 scale and we're doing an online build we're not getting wound down and with accuracy and stuff because then you know i won't finish it so i'm just going to pull those apart slightly just because i want a bit of a gap between them just to sort of make them look a bit better so we'll come in with a blade and just Push that blade in between there just to get them just apart, just like that. OK, so that should be nice and square now. Yep. So get some glue in behind there. OK, so that's that in place. The good thing this is again you see because we've used plastic cement we can we can play with it and move it around and everything we don't have to we're not you know restricted by super glue it's bang it's there i want to even up that gap i'm not happy with that gap there we go and then with this one here we've got number two i've just glued the wrong one on there idiot that is number two this is number three here Duh. God, I make a lot of mistakes. I think I'm getting old and senile. Well, I'm definitely getting old. I don't know if I'm getting senile or not. There you go. We've got a gap between them. So I'll just put some extra thin down in there. And then number two <laughs> is going to go in next to it there, like so. Again. We'll have a gap, so I'll put a gap in there, a gap in there. Get some extra thin down in there. There we go. Okay, so that's those in there. And then this one here, obviously, we need to use super glue because it's brass. And then that one is going to sit on top of that one there, like that. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll grab. A drop of super glue. Where's my tool? Where did the thing go? I appear to have lost the door. Okay, so here we are now, two hours later. By the way, I've changed the camera to auto because I just can't get, get into the settings at all. Um, now, one of the beauties of filming YouTube videos is when you lose stuff, you can go back and look. Now, I remember, I can't remember what I was building there, but I cut something and it went, phew, and it was gone. And I was able to go back, slow the video down to about 50, you know, 50th speed. And I was able to watch the, the part sort of launch across the bench and then bounce off something and go back across that way. And I was able to find it because I could see which direction it went in. Now, I've just looked back on the video and I can see that when I put my hand down, it was stuck to the back of my hand. Then I went, oh my God, where's that gone? I don't know where it's gone, blah, 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 blah. And I got over, and over here, I've got my remote for the camera. This is the Sony ZV-1 stand thing. Um, I've got it wrapped in a bag to keep the dust out of it. 
So basically, uh, that is part over there. So I put my, I went from here over there, click the film off, and that's it. I then went to the toilet. <laughs> so, um, and then I came back and looked everywhere for it. So the fact that it was stuck to my hand, I was kind of hoping it would fall off on the bench somewhere but it could have fallen off anywhere. I have checked inside my trousers. I'm sorry if that's disgusting, but I've had to check inside. Um, it may have gone down the toilet. I don't know. Um, I cannot find it anywhere. So for now, at least, this is going to have to just have those unless I decide to scratch build something or I want to just spend the rest of my life trying to find it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I really did want to have it on there because these things, to me, these, these boxes, to me, they are quite a feature of the model. Um, because they add a bit of interest to what would otherwise just be a slab sided thing and this has got a lot of detail missing for instance on on this part here uh, this is this goes next to the uh, cockpit there should be a wheel on the front of there and a wheel on the top like a spider wheel which is a, I think it's trim um, probably rudder and um, elevator trim now they're completely missing they're completely missing on the 30 scale, second scale kit and you don't even get them in the Edward set. So that was my reason for getting the Robert um, Morozowski one. So, Morozowski should I say. If you haven't seen the review of that, go and have a look. It is gorgeous, 3D printed, 30 second scale Lancaster cockpit. It is beautiful. Um, so, what are we going to do? Uh, I think I'm going to turn the camera off and look some more. Um, and probably call this a day for part one, although we haven't done much. Because I don't really want to, the next thing I want to do is, is paint everything, you know, give it an undercoat ready for the green. Um, when I say undercoat, I mean ready for chipping and stuff like that. So we're going to do some hairspray work on this. So I don't want to be doing that and then find it and have to go in and do corrective touch-ups and everything because it just won't look right. That's the whole thing with weathering. It needs to be a, a big blend on, on the whole thing. So um, I'm going to call that a day for this video. I know it's been a short one. The others will be longer, I promise you. I try to make them about an hour long, um, like I did with the Vulcan. And um, I think that's sort of what, what everybody likes. If I find it in the next few minutes, I'll come back and, and we'll go from there. But I'm afraid that right here, right now, I'm going to call it a day for this video because I cannot find it anywhere. Well, guys, good news. There it is. I found it. I have just gone around. A little trick I always do, and you can do this yourself at home. Get the vacuum. Get a dirty sock out of the washing basket. Don't use a clean one because it'll get all ruined. Um, put the sock over the end of the vacuum. Not not your roll on vacuum or sort of vacuum hose. Put the sock over. Hold it nice and tight. Turn the vacuum on and then go around and vacuum and anything that's on the floor will get caught in the sock and then you can go through. I didn't find it like that. I, I put everything away. I thought that's it. I give up. Um, went in the bedroom just to have another quick check inside my jeans and everything. And uh, there it was on the floor in the bedroom. So it got from here to the bedroom probably 30, 40 feet or 30 feet. So uh, yeah, it, it travelled probably stuck in my sock or something like that. So there we go. We've got it. So he who persists wins in the end. So what we're going to do now is come along with our knife and we're going to... You can tell it's been a long time because the glue's all solid and the parts aren't moving around. And the, the super glue in the tray has all gone off, so I've had to put another drop in there. So uh, there we go. So I can grab a drop of super glue here. Put it on there. Okay, now I'm going to have to be really careful with positioning. I've put the tools away because I wanted them out of the way. It's really careful with positioning this. We get it right first time. So, because we ain't going to get more than one chance at this, I don't think, because this glue goes off pretty instant. There we go, that's on there. There we are. Okay, and just, oops, not, I've dropped it again. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. This is not happening, guys. Right, <laughs> it's on there. And it's on there for good. Okay, um, no more trips around the house, no more. Ugh. What a nightmare, what a waste of time. Okay, so, um, thinking about getting ready for starting painting stuff, and I want to start pre-shading everything in black. But I'm looking around, there's a bit of work we need to do. On this um, control column, you've got this lump sticking out the side. That is where they put the uh, e e extension in, so you can have a co-pilot, as it were. Um, I don't believe the B1's had that, so it's going to go. Okay. Um, purely because I don't think the B1s are supposed to have it. So there we go. And I know in the Ian Roberts set that I reviewed, you've got the option of having it or not having it. Um, from what I've seen, it looks like the Mark 7s and the Mark 10s have it, but the 
Iridia lengths don't. So I don't know. It may have been a sort of bit by bit, just random. Did they have it or didn't they? Maybe it was added later in the war or something. I don't know. But um, I know that in World War Two they they had a shortage of pilots, so they didn't plan to have two pilots in the length anyway. So initial ones wouldn't have had it on. So there we go. That's gone. Uh, the other thing is the instrument panel here. We need to prepare that for the photo etch. So we've basically got to remove all of the detail off of that. So we're going to be sanding all the detail off, cutting off these lumps, the compass and the um, extra gauges on the top. We're going to cut them off. That'll be gone. But the other thing we need to do is get these rudder pedals done. Now, as you can see here, these rudder pedals aren't particularly nice at all. They're very chunky, but Edward gives us some lovely little fine ones um, here. You can see them along there. They are um, they are very nice indeed. Probably easier if I show you on the instructions. What we're going to do is get two bits of brass there, a piece of plastic rod between them, piece over the top, and then glue those assemblies into the uh, stanchions for the rudder pedals. So this should be fun. So um, I'll probably do this off camera because I need a magnifier. So and then I'll just come back and show you when it's actually done. Okay, pedals are done. Had to. Um, Sold the little cross braces on. They're good, you can see them there, but they're uh, they're done. I'll show you in a minute when they're all together. So, following the instructions, we've got to cut the lumps off the bottom of these rudder pedals. Now, we need to make sure they go back together the same length this way because otherwise they're dragging on the floor. So, um, what I've done, I've got the table top. This is the navigator radio table. Turn that upside down, and I've put a piece of tape on it to mark the length. That the rudder pedals need to come out so we've got that ledge to go against there and then that's that so we'll just get our cutters so our new trumpeter cutters and we're going to cut them off as they say here and what they tell you to do is cut them off they tell you to cut them off just above the the lugs so we'll cut them off there 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 and there okay so that's that done and then i'm going to take a 200 grit zebra stick and just sand to get these kind of square. There we go. And then we'll get a finer stick and just literally go around them just to kind of we'll get a sponge for that. We'll get a, one of the infinity sponges and we'll just take the edges off just like this. It's funny, I was watching the in-betweeners thing last night, the um, on Saturday night, the the uh, live stream, and um, Dad was on there, Mike, and he was calling me an MB-10. So apparently uh, all those guys on there now, they use an MB-10 with premium hobbies and get 10% off all their Infinity Sanding Sticks. And uh, apparently they love them and will never go back. So that's good news. Right, so we've got this in here. Now the lug, a square lug on there, is going to fit into the back of the instrument panel. So basically, let's get this rubbish out of the way. So basically, with the square lug facing up, with that placed in there, like so. In fact, what I could do is tape that in. Tape that in place like that, just to hold it there. Okay, and then we'll get some tweezers. I don't know as well. This is going to go on camera, probably not well at all. But because I've got the point for the lug pointing forward, those little cross braces also have to point forward. So these are going to glue into there. Now, as you can see, they are not as wide as the distance of them. So what I'm going to do is pull these in a touch. You're not going to see much of this. You're going to see the rudder pedals at the bottom, but you're not going to see much of this because you're kind of looking down into the cockpit. I'm also a little concerned. I haven't got this very square, have I? Um, let's take this out of here. Just have a look at that. That one there is... Come on, Mike. Seven point three, and that one there is. Oh, for God's sake! What am I doing? Right, so that one there is seven point five, and that one there is seven point two. So I haven't got them very square. So I need to just square them up so they look a bit more even. 
Okay, so that's 7.2. That's 7.2. Great. So get the sponge again, just round them off. Okay, so that's that done. We'll grab our tabletop back, put this in there, tape it in. There we are, that's that in there. Right, so now we can come along with this with those legs bent together. Just going to bend them together a bit more. Okay, so there we go. And then this one. Get the right way around. This one can go into there like that. And sit in there and stay there. Okay, so that's them positioned. I need to get them square and everything and get them glued in. Now if you look at the HK models 132nd Lancaster, I think they've got the rudder paddles at different lengths, so you need to do a bit of surgery to sort them out. Okay, so there they are in like that. So what we need to do now is just lift the plastic parts up. And push the photo edge down and it all falls apart. Look, oh, this is a nightmare. I think we'll do one at a time. So what we'll do is hold the photo edge in place, lift the plastic parts up so everything's nice and square. like so. Okay so at last they are done and uh, what a nightmare, what a load of work for pretty much nothing. If I was doing this again I wouldn't bother to be honest. Um, the rotor pedals in the kit aren't very nice but for what you can see of them I think we could have just left them as they were really. Um, that goes in there like you can see now that the you can see that's in there and you can see it's very difficult to get them all straight and true and everything. I don't know why if they had to make them, why they couldn't just make, you know, one piece that folded and then put a rod through. It would have been a lot easier to keep it all square. Why they had to make it like that with the separate pieces, um, I don't know. Edouard do some very funny things sometimes that really, you know, I, I mean, it's like with this. Um, I'll go over the page here. We're looking at these boxes in the back. Now these these sit in the back. This is the radio operator stuff and the navigator stuff. And you can't see most of it. And they're actually, they're giving you boxes to fold up to replace the plastic boxes that come in the kit. Um, and it's all back, you're not even going to see it. So I don't understand, you know, they do all that, but then they don't give us the little trim rolls for the, for the cockpit, which are so, so visible through the glazing. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. I'd rather they, you know, they, they remade this, you know, that simple lump of plastic, remake that with photo etch rather than mess around with making radio boxes that you're never going to see. And stuff like that, you know, the red rudder pedals, you could have made it with the brace across the middle of two sides, fold them over, put a rod through, job done. Um, why do they have to make them like that? It's, it's just beyond me. So um, I think we'll call that a day. Oh, well, we'll just we'll just clean up this instrument panel. So basically, as I say, when we look at the instructions, it's telling us we need to remove where you've got red. It means remove. So it's telling us to remove all the detail from this instrument panel, any raised areas, any raised lumps. You can see we've got those buttons across the middle there and anything on there. So what we're going to do is come along with our cutters and we will cut there and we will cut away here. I don't want to go too mad with these trumpeter cutters because I fear they may chip. So we'll go nice and gentle. Okay, and again, we can look at our instructions. And we can see that it's telling us to remove that lump in there as well. So what we'll do is we'll come along with our nice new curved blade that we got for our photo etch. We can go in there and remove that. Okay, just come down onto it up onto it like that. That's that gone. We can carve away this plastic here. But bear in mind guys, HK 
plastic is very, very hard. Oops, we're not supposed to take away those lumps on the side. You've got to leave those there. So another mistake. This is the trouble. You're doing stuff on camera and you're sort of concentrating on what the camera's seeing and trying to keep it interesting, which is difficult for me. Um, you make mistakes. I'm not particularly worried about that because we've got a photo etch panel that's going to go around there anyway, look, so I'm not really too worried about the fact that I've taken the top of that off. Okay, and then now we can do is scrape away Got that raised pilot's panel there, which is the generic one that goes in pretty much every British World War II aircraft. There we are, so that's all most of that gone. Just get rid of that. And then with a nice coarse sanding stick, we can come along and just sand all that detail away. Just like so. Till it's nice and smooth and flat, ready for the photo etch panel to go on. A bit more scraping around these raised areas. And then what we'll do is we'll get the instrument panel off the photo etch fret and we'll check it all fits before we give this a coat of black. Just to make sure when we put the photo etch on we don't get any grey plastic showing through because it'll stick it like a sore thumb. And there we go. That's our panel all cleaned up. So I think I've done that in the area there. Yep, I have. That's all done. So we're good to go now. There we are. So that's all ready now. So we can throw those bits of plastic away, give the bench a clean. And then we'll be back for part two. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.